If you have your Bibles there, we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. As I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all heavens, all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So a great scripture passage here, very meaningful scripture passage. Um, <clears throat> Paul reminds us that he is sitting in a prison here. He says, I'm a prisoner, but a prisoner for the Lord. And he, and he says this, as he's preaching to the Ephesian church here, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Um, just to think about that a little bit, um, one of the things I would remind all of us is that God has given all of us a calling in life. In, in that calling... We have an example to live out, and we have many witnesses around us, people that are observing our lifestyle, the decisions we make, and are seeing if our walk will match our talk. And here, in this particular verse here, he says, I urge you, I urge you as, as fellow Christians, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And, and that thought, when you're thinking worthy, that thought just means that there's a high calling. In order to be found worthy means that there's a really high standard. There's a, a high measurement. And sometimes we try to do that out of our own strength. Sometimes we think that by doing a certain amount of things or following a certain list that we're going to measure up to the standard. But every single one of us, after a while at trying this, we all realize that we come utterly short of the standard that God has set for us. And that standard can only be achieved with the help of Jesus Christ. We see that more and more and more. And so he talks about this here for a while. He says, he says um, here are some ways that you walk in a, in a manner that's worthy of the calling. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, in bearing with one another in love. You know, that's, uh, that's a, a, a dear passage that we could probably say is still needed today, right? Maybe even we could say that's especially needed today. You know, when we think about this thought, bearing with one another in love, you know, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, I don't know if you have realized recently, but I, I feel like more and more, and I, I, I realize people are under stress, people are under anxiety because of, of the circumstances around us today. But, but this thought of walking in humility and meekness and patience or gentleness, um, 
and bearing with one another love, that's something that we could really, really benefit from today, especially in how we relate to, to fellow, our fellow citizens around us. And, and if I think about the fact that God has a calling upon our life to walk in a manner worthy of his calling, um, let's do it in such a way that people can look at us and say, those people bear with one another in love. You know, they have a spirit of humility. They have a spirit of gentleness, of meekness, of patience. And, and uh, let's allow our attitude as we face really tough circumstances now to, to make it, um, to have other people look at us and see that there's a spirit of love there. They care for each other. They minister to each other. They, they put up with each other. Even in all our weird ideas, right? <laughs> in all our strangeness, we put up with each other. I think verse 2 gives us a, a good clue there that he is very well aware that he's dealing with a, a, a lot of imperfect people. I, I'm reminded of the story where Jesus says that if you're invited to a feast, don't go take the most important position mm -hmm. and seat yourself there lest somebody more important comes and removes you and let them have that spot. But rather, go take the lowest spot, and if somebody comes and urges you to come sit there, then you're in a place of honor. You won't be humiliated. So if you go yeah. in humility, recognizing yourself not to even be the most important person in the room when you walk in. Uh, I'm reminded of that story because he says, with all humility and gentleness. You know, sometimes we're all at a different level of our walk with Christ. Some are have been doing it a lot longer. They're more mature than others. He says patiently, gently, or with patience, bearing with one another, knowing that there's going to be differences, there's going to be conflict possibly. We're supposed to bear with one another, recognizing we have the same calling. Maybe not the exact same job within the calling, but we all have the same calling to attain this perfection that Jesus has, but we can't attain it, not on our own. So he says, with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, because he's doing the work in us that is making us more like him. We can't even produce that on ourselves. But he says, we're supposed to do that and be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, recognizing that there's more important things than for you to come and do be dominant in a way where your way is the better way and everybody else has to learn from you. Sometimes taking that step back and saying, you know what, I don't know it all, and it's okay if I learn from the next person as well. Not to come in and, and bulldoze your way to the top, so to speak, and say everybody should be learning from me, but always seeking, sometimes even if the other person isn't right, the, if it's not a matter of sin anyways, you still need to take a step back in humility and say, you know what, this person also has a point of view, and he also is getting direction from God. Some of us are maybe listening more attentively than others, but it doesn't mean that we have a right to bulldoze our way through. We're always supposed to seek that unity mm -hmm. uh, in the bond of peace so that we're not stepping on people, that we're not pushing them aside, thinking that my way is better, my thoughts are better, and automatically, if I'm in the room, I'm the most important person. Yeah. One of the, the keys here, too, is the word eager. You know how uh, he's, he doesn't say... Um, drag your feet to a point where you're going to find unity. He says, be eager. There should be an eagerness in you to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It's, it's not one where you have to try to somehow work yourself up to a point where you can now finally bear with one another in love. You can now finally be um, walking in a spirit of unity. No, there should be an eagerness. There should be a desire in every single one of us to say, you know, I'm tired of, of, of being hypocritical. I'm tired of, of um, not living for Jesus the way he has called me to in his word. Um, and, and there should be an eagerness about us to say, how can I endeavor to bring unity among God's people? Instead of just, oh, maybe I can somehow work it into... That, that's not... It's not about working yourself up. It's about a desire that God gives you. You have this eagerness to maintain the unity um, of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In verse 4 there, um, the next portion here, he talks about what unity looks like. 
He says there's one body. Um, just so you know, the body here at Lighthouse Gospel Church isn't the only body. There's a universal body of Christ that meets all across the globe. That, but that body of Christ is specific to ones who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he, was, that he died and was resurrected. He's seated at the right hand of God, that he's coming again, um, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that believe a lot of different things. But there is only one universal church with Jesus Christ as the head of it. There's only one. Just like he says, there's only one faith. There, there's all kinds of faiths around us, right? People that believe in Buddha, that believe in, in um, uh, Muhammad as God's prophet, as in Allah, and, and, and all these kinds of things. Um, there's, there's people that, uh, that, that are Hindus. You know, there's, there's faiths all around us, but there is actually only one faith. That's what sets Christianity apart. You know, there's, you can go to a lot of religions in the world today, and they will say, um, yeah, if you're a good enough Christian, you'll get to heaven. If you're a good enough Muslim, you get to heaven. If you're good enough Hindu, you'll get to heaven. If you're good enough, um, uh, if you, you know, in, when it comes to Buddhism or whatever, you'll, you'll get to heaven. They, they'll, stay, they'll say things like, there are many roads that lead to heaven. And in fact, there are some, some Christian preachers that will even say something like that as well. Um, TV evangelists that we should have nothing to do with. We'll get to that a bit later here. Um, but there is actually only one faith. And that's what makes Christianity often a very hated religion. Because when we preach the truth of God, we're saying the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. It's an exclusive type of faith. There's, there's only one faith. There's only one that counts. There's only one baptism. Um, in our, in our um, background, many of you have been taught this, this passage here to, to believe that it means that there's only one water baptism. In fact, he's not even talking about water baptism here. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's only one baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there is only one baptism. Some, some people have get three, four, ten water baptisms. That, uh, that's not what this is talking about. There's only one Lord, there's only one faith, and there's only one baptism. There's only one true baptism. And that's the baptism that you experienced when you received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You received a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, there's only one God. Just like there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there's only one baptism, there's only one God, there's only one Father who is over all and through all and in all. Yeah, the way uh, most of us grew up, we would have thought something along this lines, if, if I change my life enough and, and stop sinning, at least the ones that I can, stop with that, be good enough, and then get baptized by water, that will mean I am now saved, and then I have a chance to hope that I can get to heaven one day. And if we're, if we're using baptism in that sense, then we're putting all of our hope into that one baptism rather than Jesus, the one that died for us on that cross. But now if we're saying, uh, I need to be rebaptized. And then I need to be rebaptized, or however many times some people have uh, done up to four or five times, or however many times, you're still putting too much hope and faith into this baptism. It's a symbol of what's happened inside. The baptism is by the Holy Spirit is what's actually changing you. The water baptism is only a symbol of it. It's not actually doing the work of baptizing by the Holy Spirit. That's only the water is only a symbol of being washed by the Spirit and being baptized by Him. Right. So if you're if you're thinking that one baptism is what saves you, or if you think you have to get rebaptized and then you're going to be in good standing, you're still putting too much faith in this water baptism. It's talking about being baptized by the Holy Spirit. That is what actually washes over you and cleanses you. Because you yourself, by water baptism, doesn't have that effect because you step out and you're still going to be dirty. But this Holy Spirit is the one, even First John 
1 verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive them, and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that's by the Holy Spirit, not by works of the flesh or anything that we can add to it. Amen. And I like what he says with, in the, in the seventh verse, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's not, we're not all here to do the exact same thing, and we'll get into that a little bit later on where he's gotten different gifts that are spread out in his church, but all those gifts are spread out in his church for a specific purpose. He's saying here, according to the grace, according to the measure of Christ's gift is what you, each one has been given. Amen. Yeah, so this, this whole next portion here <coughs> talks a little bit about um, the gifts here, but before he does that, um, verse 8 and 9 are an, is an interesting passage there of Scripture too. He says, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And just, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but, but just to, to briefly talk about this a little bit, Peter talks about this in his, his epistles as well. Uh, he talks about, um, uh, about uh, Christ going and ministering to the spirits who are in prison. And, and most, most biblical theologians, and I, I tend to agree with a lot of that, um, is, is the thought that when, when Jesus uh, was crucified, um, he went into, like he says, the lower regions of the earth. Um, David talks about uh, Hades sometimes, or he talks about um, Sheol, which is like the place of the dead. Um, one of the things, and, and it's, this is my theory, it's my opinion, and, and I know a lot of, a lot of other biblical scholars believe this as well, that, that when Christ died, um, he went down to speak to the spirits who were in prison, meaning he, w he went and spoke to all those who would have died having faith in God and, and preached the gospel to them in these regions so that in heaven, every single person will be there because they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's a thought that most biblical scholars have. Um, they believe that, that, that Christ went to the place of the dead. That's where he, he grabbed a hold of the keys of death and of hell, like Scripture says, and, uh, and, and defeated the enemy. Well, his, his death on the cross did that, but uh, that he went and he spoke to these um, souls that were bound in prison still. And, and then just a thought there, uh, in verse 8 there he says, he led a host of captives. And so, so that's an interesting thought, that he went down, he descended down, he took the host of captives with him, and he, has, he led them up into the heavenly places so that they are also seated with Christ now after they believed, after he gave them an opportunity to believe in him as Lord and Savior. And you know, to, to some of you, you might think, well, that's way over here. I don't, I don't know about that one. <laughs> um, that's, it, it, it's hard to know exactly the specifics of that, but it seems to me that that's the case that happened there, um, that he, uh, as, he descended which speaks about the fact that he was on the earth, but he went lower than the earth. And then he ascended, which means he was on the earth, but he ascended into heaven. And so that the, the earth was like the middle region, and, and there was a lower region where he went to speak to those um, who had died in faith, but who needed to hear the gospel. Which means then that, that every single person in heaven will have had opportunity, even all the way back to Adam that they'll have had an opportunity to, to hear the gospel that was preached to them from that point on. But I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. Do you want to share anything about that? Or? No, I think you covered no. it. Okay, then let's go to verse 11. Verse 11 says, And he, being God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up, the body of Christ. Um, let's just stop there a little bit. In today's day, uh, I don't know if you've ever thought of this fact that in our church here, we don't have apostles. Have you ever thought of that? In, in fact, we don't necessarily have prophets either. We don't say, say there's prophet Peter here, you know. 
we, we talk about elders and deacons because we see the Apostle Paul um, planting elders and deacons throughout the churches. And we, we get into things like pastors and teachers and shepherds, like he talks about here as well. Um, he talks about evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. But I, I just wanted you to, to think about that a little bit because um, my understanding of this is that there are no apostles on the earth anymore. That, that in fact, uh, the Apostle Paul was, was, was the apostle that um, if you get into Scripture there, Paul actually says that he was, he was um, last but not least, that he was the least of all the apostles. But he, but he was still called to be an apostle. And one of the prerequisites that you see in Scripture, an apostle had to see Christ, had to witness Christ. And Paul says, I was actually almost um, one that, that was born out of, out of time. But then he says, Christ appeared to me on the road to Damascus and, and gave Paul <coughs> his ministry as an apostle. Today, we know that all around us, there are, there are some churches and some cults that we know where people claim to be apostles, um, and we know them to be false teachers. We know them to be, to be people that are, are, preaching a, um, are preaching a heresy. Uh, we don't believe that today God is, has called apostles. Uh, and so what he has called, though, is evangelists, people to share the good news of the gospel, and shepherds and teachers. And so shepherds and teachers are people who, who shepherd the, the flock of God, who provide oversight to the church, and who provide teaching to the church, and, and are, are also able to provide accountability and need to be held accountable as well, um, have an important role there. But he says in verse 12, uh, all of this is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And when he says equipping the saints, that's, that's the body. That's, that's not... Equipping the saints doesn't mean the, equipping the people who are preaching or teaching. Mm -hmm. the, the job of the preachers and teachers are to equip the saints to go out into ministry. Your, your life, when you're walking, talking, and breathing, is ministry to the world, or it's supposed to be. And the job of, uh, of these evangelists and preachers and teachers are to equip the body to have enough knowledge, courage, and maybe even zeal to go out and actually witness to people out on the streets in your jobs, in your homes, in your families, grocery stores, wherever you go. It's not the, 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 the teacher's and preacher's job to go and evangelize the world necessarily, not that they can't be part of it, but, but their job is to equip the, the saints, the ones that come in on Sunday morning to listen to the sermons, to equip them to go out and do the job. It's not, uh, and sometimes you hear somebody say, oh, here's a, a person, he's a non-believer, uh, can you come talk to him? No, you go talk to him. Like, you're one of the saints, you have this. If you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, sometimes you'd be surprised when you put yourself in a situation where you actually go and want to proclaim Christ to somebody, that he will give you something to say, hmm. that you're not going to be left high and dry. Having said that, you do need to spend time in the Word of God to have something to recall, to share it with. If you're thinking, I'm born again, I've never read the Word, but I want God to just kind of give me these verses so I can snap them off at people when I'm in contact with them, that, that doesn't quite work that way. You actually have to spend time in the Word so you have something to, for, for you to recall. And I've had an experience uh, several times when you're kind of put on a spot and you're talking to somebody and they have questions, all of a sudden, Scripture verses will pop into your mind that you didn't even realize that you had memorized. All of a sudden, you'll say, oh, and 1 John 1 verse 9, it says that he's the one who does the cleansing if you conf confess, confess your sins. Or like all these different verses that all of a sudden you're recalling these verses that you've read in the past and, and then you can teach that to people who are, who are asking questions. So the job of these preachers, teachers, shepherds is actually to equip the saints that are gathering at the church to go out and minister mm -hmm. so that they will be equipped for the ministry. But not only just for that, but also for building up the body of Christ, not, not to only be outward focused, but also that we together build each other up. Amen. And then the, the next part there, um, so 
so the, the, the gifts that God has given in the church are designed to equip the saints until we all attain, verse 13, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So one of the things that God wants us to reach on the earth here is mature manhood, mature womanhood. God wants us to reach a level of maturity. Um, so that means God wants to see a steadiness in our life. He wants to see us become grounded in our faith. Um, and he has equipped the gifts in the church so that we would all become grounded in the faith. One of the things that we endeavor as a, as a church leadership here is to, to, to really preach the word of God in its entirety. Um, every single doctrine that the word of God gives us, our desire is to teach it among all of you here so that as a church we become grounded so that when people uh, would attempt to, to cause us to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, we would, we would no longer be children. He says that's what children do. That's what people who aren't grounded in their faith, who don't have a foundation, you know, the, the minute somebody comes knocking on their door and says, well, this is what the Bible says. Uh, if you're a child, you're like, oh, then that's what I should do. And then the next week somebody else comes knocking on your door or gives you a phone call or sends you a message or, or sends you a video or an article. And then you say, you're like, oh, I guess I had it wrong last week. Now I'm going to go over and believe this this week. Well, that's, that's a huge, huge problem. One of the, the biggest issues in that, the, 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 the reason why today there are many children, Scripture says that that's what a little, a little child does. The reason why many people are in a position like that today is because they have neglected the Word of God. They aren't grounded in the Word of God. There's no, their, their foundation is very quickly um, ready to crumble. And so today, we're in an information age today. Every single one of you knows this. You can go to YouTube. You can go to Facebook. You can go to um, anywhere on the internet, and you can find sermons to listen to. And you can find powerful speakers to listen to. You know, some of them will, will uh, blow you away with the things that they say. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be fascinated by some of the, 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 the effective way people communicate. Notice this. By human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And let me tell you this. There are televangelists all over the place today that have trained themselves by human cunning to know how to publicly speak to people in order to gain followers. Well, if your motivation, say for example, your motivation is finances and you desire to be really wealthy, there are evangelists today or, or so-called evangelists today that have a massive following because they've learned the art of public speaking very well. doesn't mean they're filled by the Spirit of God, but they're tremendous public speakers. They're, you, know, you can listen to them and you can be glued to every single word that they say. It doesn't mean they have the anointing of the Lord on their life. Even if they have 50,000 followers or 100,000 followers or a couple of million followers. That, that, that's, that's not necessarily indicative that they have the anointing of the Lord. I remember years ago, um, and, and Spurgeon said something like this too, but um, there was a man that we had here named Richard Owen Roberts. Many of you remember him. One of the things that always stuck out to me is he said, uh, in order to preach the word of God, I do not need the affirmation of man. I, 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 I always remembered that. Because in our world today, Many public speakers say, no, I need the affirmation of man. Um, dependent on how many views I get, how, many, how much feedback I get, that's how I know I'm a good speaker or not. Well, that's not what God says. In fact, um, many of the loneliest men in Scripture, men like Jeremiah, 
men like Isaiah, men like Ezekiel, you know, these were not popular people of the day. They were fiery men of God that God used in very amazing ways. But I just, want, I just thought it would be very good for us to just think about that a little bit. There's people all around you. There's, there's people you can tune in today that are skilled, that have trained themselves, have gone to universities, have gone to college. Um, they, they, they're very, very talented at being able to speak to people. And they use human cunning and they use craftiness and deceitful schemes. And the best way to avoid getting caught up in all of that is to ground yourself in the Word of God. And you know what? Paul even said this to the Bereans. He said he was so grateful that after he preached, they went home and they looked at the Scriptures to see if the things that he said were really so. You guys all ought to be doing that. It doesn't matter what you listen to. You need to double-check it with the Word of God. What we say up here in the German service or the English service, what any preacher in our land says, you ought to go back to the Word of God and double-check it and see, is this the truth? Is this what God's Word actually says? And, and uh, know that there are numerous people out there that will try to deceive you and cause you to be like these little children that are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know, I think uh, some of these fantastic speakers, like you're saying, they've, they've been trained in how to capture your attention. They, they know what words are these, um, these big ticket words where you will, your ears will, will perk up and you'll listen, oh, and the, the, they'll sprinkle truth throughout to keep you interested enough that at the end when they have this somber music playing and when they say, hit that donate button on the bottom that you'll actually start donating to their cause when you're really not even sure why, but they've said a lot of things, and they've got the right kind of music playing at the end that gets your emotions going to the point where you say, I have to donate. I have to help them with their cause. Mm. And if you spend time for yourself, you alone with God and His Word, when they start speaking about these things, alarm bells go off in your head, and you're saying, something's wrong. I'm not sure what it is, but something just is not right about what they're saying. And then you compare it to the Word of God and you can quickly see those that are there to get rich, that want money, this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that's not a gospel, but that they're preaching everywhere. Mm. It's a horrible deception to a lot of these children who are not grounded, solid in their faith. They're looking for, I've had a horrible thing happen in my life, and I need a fix. And this guy promised that he would pray and it would be done. And all I got to do is give him $10,000 or $500 or 20 bucks, whatever. They are trained to get you emotionally hyped up enough for you to hit that button. But if you're grounded in the Word of God, you'll recognize that he doesn't care about money. God cares about your soul and where it will go. He doesn't care about how many people you're going to pay at the end. Tithing to, to, to ministry to further God's kingdom is all good. But it's never a requirement for your soul or for your sickness or for whatever you're going through to get better that you're going to pay somebody and it's going to magically happen. It's not a possibility. But if we are grounded, we're not going to be like children tossed through, uh, back and forth through all this cunning, scheming, deceitfulness. But rather, in verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. That's the point. That's our, our mark, our goal. If you want to try to attain to be like somebody, Christ is your picture mm. of who you're supposed to uh, uh, try to attain to. You're not going to be like Christ, obviously, but, but He is our goal. It's not some great speaker. It's not anybody who's been in the faith longer than you. It's Jesus who's the head of the church. Amen. Yeah, notice too, he says, speaking the truth in love. Um, when, when I think of that, it, to me it means when you are confronting someone, you ought not to try to beat around the bush. You're supposed to speak the truth, but in a spirit of love. Mm. You know, don't, don't put them, uh, don't put yourself in front of them or, or, or don't judge them um, harshly, especially for something that you might be doing yourself. Uh, but speak the truth in love. We, we're called to do this, brothers and sisters. You know, when, when you see somebody um, toying with <coughs> sin or, 
or playing with something that you know is going to lead them to destruction, speak the truth to them in love. And let them know, hey, I care about you enough that I feel like I need to confront you about this. I need to talk to you about these things. Because right now, in, in my understanding, you're going down a path that's leading to harm for you or your family or your children. Um, so speak the truth to them in love. And he says, as we do that, um, the whole body joint and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know, it's, it's just like when you're, f when you're exercising. You know, some of you here probably spend a lot of time exercising and you know exactly how to physically condition your body so that it performs to its utmost. Well, you know that every joint um, is held together by other joints and uh, when it is working properly, you can perform really well, whether it's in sports, whether it's in um, physical activity to some extent. When your body is fine-tuned, it, it really performs well. Well, spiritually speaking as well. When we're following these things, when we're not getting caught up in, in bad teaching and uh, we're grounded in the Word of God, we're speaking the truth in love, we're exercising the gifts God has given us, um, and we're walking in unity, then he says this body grows so that it builds itself up in love. And that's our desire, that as a church we would grow and be built up in love and that every part would be working well. And you know what, brothers and sisters, many of you here today, you, you're needed here in, the, in this church. God has given you gifts, and when used properly, uh, this church here will be found building itself up in love. So let's use our gifts. Let's be willing to say, Lord, here am I. I want to be used in the right way, but I want to be grounded in the Word of God, and I want my actions to be based on the fact that I'm grounded in the Word of God. And as a result, I'm going to contribute because God has given gifts to the church, just like He said here. He's given some to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He's given these things in the church. Study Romans chapter 12. Study 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those are two other passages in Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts. And understand that God has a place for you, but His desire is that we would build each other and together, uh, that we build ourselves together up in love. Amen. All right. You want to close in prayer there, Pete? Yep. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, we come before you again. We want to give you thanks, Lord, that we can always again come back to you and your word and find out what your plan is for man, what your plan is for the church, how it should function, the purpose of it. Lord, all these things are, are needed for us today as reminders that we are not, uh, not caught up in the act of either uh, squabbling inwardly in our, amongst our own midst or even pointing out other people's flaws, but that we that we know that we each one of us has a job to do, like the how a body should work together, physically, knowing that your church is in the same way it functions well when everybody works together. So, Father, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts, even just draw us closer to yourself, so that we would be able to do this, that we would we would be able to do it well, that we would function as a church the way you have prescribed it, even that we would be able to in love build each other up recognizing that the most important thing is that souls are saved, not the minor details that are attached to, to the daily things, but, but that we would all together in unity build one another up, knowing that we together have a ministry to reach out to those that haven't heard yet. So Father, I just pray that you would do a work in us, that we would recognize that the greatest of all these things is love, that we would not neglect that but that we would exercise it daily, especially to your fellow believers in the church. Thank you, Lord, for what you will do there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.